I think we're ready to get started. Good. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Neither rain nor... St oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's the wrong federal agency. Uh, it's really good to see all of you, and listen, thank you so much for uh, uh, working through the uh, snow and ice. Uh, you know, Pam, if you're from Chicago, this is like, no, this is a spring day, and, uh, uh, but, but, you know, here in Washington, boy, a little rain, a little snow, a little ice, and it's just like, that's a great excuse for us to shut down. And we've already been through a shutdown, so, so, uh, so we, certainly, uh, we certainly don't need that uh, again. Look, thank you, first of all, very much for joining us today. I know uh, uh, you have incredibly busy schedules. We're going to keep you busy uh, uh, from 9 to 1. It was going to run a little bit longer, but, but somebody else who uses microphones and things like this, the vice president, said he needed this room, and so it was kind of touch and go, but uh, we decided... You know, since he signs my paycheck, uh, uh, how important it was that we acquiesce to him. Uh, we're delighted that you're here. Uh, there are a number of people here that we could uh, single out and recognize and thank and, and tell you how much uh, we appreciate not only your attendance and participation in helping to design this conference, but also what you've done in the field and the amount of work and the, and the contributions you've made. And, uh, and then I would use up my entire time doing that uh, for all of you. There is one person I certainly do want to uh, recognize, though, for just a minute because uh, he's not only been a great friend and great supporter, but just such an incredible leader in this area, and that's uh, former Congressman Patrick Kennedy. Well, this is just a continuation of how we, uh, over these last four and a half years, of how we can work together and the things that we can do. And when I tell you about some of the stuff going on, uh, it's the kind of word my grandson uses, stuff, you know, the stuff going on across the field, it really is, it, it really is absolutely amazing. And it couldn't be done without collab collaboration and, and cooperation and support. But I think more importantly, the things that have gone on, really couldn't happen without some trust. Uh, you, you can't come into this job and you can't come into the, to the imprimatur of the White House in, the, in, in a leadership role and say, well, look, we're going to put all of these things out there and, uh, and it's going to be a, a really good effort. You really have to spend a lot of time building relationships um, and watching you build relationships. Uh, for my whole career in law enforcement, uh, you know, my, my knowledge of the treatment field was pretty limited. And frankly, I could tell you I was a bit suspicious of the treatment field. Treatment isn't going to be effective. It's not going to work. Uh, da, 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 da. And the other side is, is I've really spent these four and a half years uh, learning about the treatment field. You know, they were pretty suspicious of the law enforcement groups. You look where we are now, it, it is, it is, light years ahead of, of where we were. Well, 25 years ago, President Reagan signed the Anti-Drug Abuse Act into law, and that led to the establishment of the Office of National Drug Control Policy. And as we observe this quarter century of service, we really reflect, we do, with a lot of pride on the progress that we've made in this country. Because there's a lot of work to do, and we all know that. There isn't anybody in this room that doesn't reflect on that. But just as important, this 25th anniversary is a great opportunity to look forward, not only with hope for the drug policies in the, in the future, but policies that are going to be successful because they're rooted in science and they're not rooted in ideology. And I want to frame a little bit of today's discussion by sharing with you the important realities that would guide the discussion of drug policy going into this way forward. First, drug abuse and its consequences place an immense burden on public health in America. And according to the CDC, uh, drug-induced overdose deaths now surpass homicides and car crashes as the leading cause of injury death in America. And the Pew poll released last month shows 44% of Americans view prescription drug abuse as a very serious public health problem. I can tell you when I went through confirmation uh, and, and uh, in the, the process of getting ready for confirmation and, and was told that uh, about the prescription drug problem, I really really was clueless. I said, you know, I, I took an oath of office to protect people in the city where I served as a police chief, and I was really totally unaware. And so during that process, I got to ask a lot of my friends and colleagues if they were aware of the prescription drug problem in this country. 
many of you were because of your background in treatment or your work in, uh, in research, but many people across, uh, across every discipline, many people were just not aware of it at all. Now to have it uh, where, a, where a great number of Americans actually recognize it, I think is an important step forward. They view that as a serious public health problem in line with cigarette smoking, alcohol abuse, and mental illness. But more importantly, I think we also recognize the human costs that uh, impact all of us. Uh, there's a huge treatment gap in this country. Today, over 20 million Americans meet the criteria for a substance use disorder, and yet only one in 10 receives treatment as a spe at a specialty facility. And this is particularly troubling, given the fact that treatment works, and it's guided millions of Americans into long-term recovery. And second, the significant costs of drug use affect each and every one of us in one way or another. 2007 alone, illicit drug use cost the nation an estimated $193 billion. That was from a Department of Justice study which really helps to illuminate the economic cost. And it places real obstacles in the way of the president's vision of an America built to last, where an educated, skilled workforce has the knowledge, energy, and expertise to compete in the global marketplace. And before I hand things back over to the group, I want to share with you a few steps that we've taken to implement real evidence-based drug policy reform over the last four years. None of this would be possible without his leadership, the president's leadership, and his specific direction to me, which, is that, uh, which was early on, that the voices of the American people need to be in his national drug control strategy, particularly when it comes to emphasizing the role of science and research and not ideology or dogma. It has to be the guiding force in these decisions that impact public health in the United States. Well, last April, we released that drug policy, and it addresses the national drug challenge as a public health issue and not just a criminal justice issue. It's built upon the latest scientific research demonstrating that addiction is a chronic disease of the brain that can be successfully prevented and treated and something from which people can recover. And as a result of the scientific evidence, the President's Drug Policy Reform Plan directs federal agencies to expand community-based efforts to prevent drug use before it begins, to empower health care workers to intervene early at the first signs of substance use disorder, to expand access to treatment for those who need it, and to support the millions of Americans in recovery. And the strategy acknowledges that while law enforcement is always going to play a vital role in protecting communities from drug-related crime and violence, we're not going to arrest our way out of this drug problem. And that's coming from someone who has spent many decades in the law enforcement community, and it's coming from the colleagues that I worked with for so many years. But this is all just a start. It's important to note that the policy builds upon an already impressive record of reform that has been achieved over these last few years, and, and it's in no small part thanks to you. So in 2009, the President signed into law the Fair Sentencing Act, which eliminated the first drug-related mandatory minimum sentence in four decades, and finally addressed the long-standing and unfair sentencing disparities between crack and powder cocaine. In 2010, the President signed the Affordable Care Act, which beginning next year and for the first time in history requires insurance companies to cover treatment for substance use disorders just as they would any other chronic disease, like diabetes or cancer. And this is the most significant piece of drug policy reform in generations. It transforms treatment into a service available to all who need it instead of a privilege for only those who can afford it. And despite the subsequent action from Congress, we were first, uh, the first administration to lift the ban on federal funding for the needle exchange programs. And that can provide an opportunity to not only stop the spread of disease among injection using drug users, while also guiding them into treatment. And we've implemented smart on crime approaches instead of tough on crime policy. And this past summer, for example, Attorney General Holder announced major changes to charging policies regarding offenses. We've also supported the expansion of drug courts, which divert over 120,000 people into treatment instead of prison each year. You'll hear more about that later on today. And we've aggressively highlighted innovative solutions to drug overdose, setting a goal to reduce overdose 
deaths in America over the next five years and promoting the life-saving drug naloxone among first responders. And this fall, we announced over $19 million in new drug-free community support program grants to 147 new coalitions and 19 new mentoring grantees across the country. And finally, we placed an historic role, or an historic focus on the role of recovery in America. There are millions of Americans in recovery from substance use disorder. We've implemented a series of reforms aimed at lifting the stigma associated with the disease of addiction and removing some of the barriers people with substance use disorders face in receiving housing, employment, and college aid. And that's what drug policy reform looks like today. And this is why we're proud to be engaged with each one of you here this morning and today. Let me, thank, let me close by asking all of you to take an opportunity during the conference to meet and learn from each other, uh, and particularly those outside your, your disciplines. And when I first took office, I made that commitment to the staff that we would do everything we can to break down silos, silos of not only those specialties, but, uh, um, uh, you know, sometimes here in Washington we don't, like to call them silos, we call them centers of excellence, but that was just a term. <laughs> well, we become a stronger and healthier nation when the people in our communities working to prevent drug use among young people, or those involved in harm reduction team up with law enforcement to work together. When the treat communi treatment community works in tandem with the criminal justice system, for example, we begin to find smarter ways to stop the revolving door of our criminal justice system. And that's the future of drug policy reform, and I'm delighted that you've come here today to be a part of this. So again, I look forward to being here all morning with you and into the afternoon, and uh, thank you so much for your, your attendance, and really also thanking you for your contributions. Well, now it's a great pleasure for me to introduce a, a, a friend and the nation's Deputy Attorney General, Jim Cole. Deputy Attorney General Cole is going to so, uh, share with us some important actions that are being taken by the Department of Justice, and the drug topic is an important topic for DOJ in a host of ways, and not just in the traditional ways that sometimes we think about it uh, when it comes to sentencing or enforcement, but also in the important ways of, of being a partner in prevention and being a supporter of treatment programs. For those of you not familiar with uh, Deputy Attorney General Cole, he was sworn in in January of 2011. He joined the department in 1979 as part of the Attorney General's Honors Program, and he served for 13 years, first as a trial attorney in the criminal division and later as Deputy Chief of the division's Public Integrity Section. He's also worked as an attorney in private practice and an adjunct faculty at Georgetown University Law Center. Center. With that, I introduce Deputy Attorney General Jim Cole. Thank you, Gil, for that introduction. Um, and I really also want to thank you for your partnership and for your tireless work on drug prevention, drug treatment, and criminal justice strategies that break the cycle of drug abuse and crime. It's an honor, and I thank you for asking me to be among this dedicated and diverse group of professionals. There's policymakers here, community leaders here, whose work promotes public health and safety, which is what we're all after. The agenda for this conference is both important and very timely. At the Department of Justice, as Gil noted, we've undertaken a number of initiatives that address the law enforcement, public safety, and public health aspects of drug policy reform. Law enforcement obviously plays an indispensable part in protecting communities from drug-related crime and violence. We know that there are dangerous people out there running drug organizations and committing murders as part of the drug trade. Clearly, those individuals need to be incarcerated for the crimes that they commit. But there are also lower-level drug defendants Many suffer from their own drug abuse issues and fall into a vicious cycle of drug abuse, criminal behavior, incarceration, and release, and too often, this cycle repeats. But recognizing that these lower-level drug defendants don't present the same public safety risks as the more serious criminals, our approach to dealing with the problems posed by drugs should not be a one-size-fits-all approach. Instead, 
we should look to provide a range of responses that includes the chance to overcome an addiction, provide the opportunity to get help before going to prison, and provide an off-ramp from the vicious cycle of drugs and crime. This approach would result in the avoidance of a criminal conviction in the first place, or it could positively affect the defendant's ability to successfully reintegrate into society in years to come. It shifts the paradigm by providing treatment and services to individuals who are motivated and truly want to turn their lives around. The advantages of this approach are many. We not only assist the individuals and their families, but we gain the ability to improve public safety and public health, directly benefiting our own citizens, our society, and more efficiently using our tax dollars. Together with our state and local enforcement partners in the field whose tireless work keeps our community safe, we continue to make real inroads in protecting public safety. Even within limited budgets, we have been able to focus our efforts on prevention and reentry as well as enforcement. For example, through the Justice Reinvestment Initiative, the department has brought state leaders, local stakeholders, private partners, and federal officials together to reform corrections and criminal justice practices. In recent years, no fewer than 17 states, supported by the department and led by governors, and legislators of both parties have directed funding away from prison construction and towards evidence-based programs and services that are designed to allow states to provide drug, drug treatment and reduce recidivism. And the results are telling. Many participating states have seen drops in recidivism rates and prison populations while still maintaining public safety. We are doing the same thing in the federal system because it has become clear that the trajectory of the federal criminal justice system left unaltered is unsustainable. Dollars are finite, and the increasing cost of the federal prison and detention population drains funds from other enforcement priorities. They take dollars away from the department's prevention and recidivism reduction programs. It limits our capacity to fund other pressing criminal justice and national security priorities, including things like hiring more agents and prosecutors or providing support to state and local partners to help in the fight against violent crime. Put simply, if we don't find a way to reduce the federal prison population, public safety is going to suffer. To try and address this problem, earlier this year, the department embarked on a review of its criminal justice policies. We made some specific changes to existing policies and strengthened our commitment to prevailing goals. We modified the Justice Department's po charging policies so that certain low-level, nonviolent drug defendants who have no significant ties to large-scale organizations, gangs, or cartels will no longer be charged with offenses that impose mandatory minimum sentences. Instead, these low-level defendants will be charged with offenses for which the accompanying sentences are much better suited to their individual conduct. By reserving the most severe prison terms for serious, high-level, and violent drug traffickers or kingpins, we enhance public safety. The department is also promoting and strengthening its diversion programs, such as drug treatment initiatives, to provide more effective alternatives to incarceration for worthy individuals. This summer, the department issued a best practices memorandum to encourage more widespread adoption by prosecutors of programs such as drug courts, specialty courts, and treatment courts. And to make sure that these programs are a top priority, every United States attorney must now designate a prevention and reentry coordinator in his or her district to ensure that this work is done. In addition, the Federal Bureau of Prisons has expanded the capacity for its residential drug abuse program, which provides important treatment to inmates. This expansion will provide more nonviolent inmates with the opportunity to deal with their drug and mental health issues that are so often at the root of criminal behavior so that they can successfully reenter and become productive members of society. Our reforms also include changes 
and the Department's framework for considering compassionate release requests. We expanded the medical criteria that can be considered and announced new criteria including considerations for elderly inmates and certain inmates who are only the only possible caregivers for their dependents. And finally, there's the Federal Interagency Reentry Council. This was created by the Attorney General and it brings together over 20 federal departments and agencies to focus on an all of government approach to helping those coming out of prison. This collaboration works to reduce barriers to housing, employment, and education, and increase access to health care and mental health treatment for those entering society. This collaboration has borne fruit, not only by increasing the chances of successful reentry for those leaving prison, but also helping incarcerated veterans get back on track, assisting children of the incarcerated, and reducing the unnecessary collateral consequences of a conviction. Across the federal government, we are partnering to strengthen communities, reduce recidivism, and improve public safety. This morning, I've discussed several steps that the department has taken to build upon successes and make changes to our criminal justice system. In light of our limited resources, we have had to take a hard look at our policies and our priorities and have recommitted to maintaining public safety in a manner that is both smart and efficient when battling drug-related crime and the conditions that breed it. As we move forward with these and other reforms, we will continue to stand and work alongside you, drawing upon your experience, relying upon your expertise, and depending on your engagement to refine and strengthen each new proposal. Today's conference and the exchange of ideas that it will foster among our nation's drug policy experts is a necessary and an important step in that process. I thank you all for being here, and I thank you all for all you're doing. Thank you. I'm trying to count the number of times before I trip getting get up the stairs. Well, I think you can see from uh, the Deputy Attorney General here, from the Deputy Attorney General's remarks, why we really uh, uh, think that this whole of government approach and this collaboration is just so important. Um, we all know the, the difficult financial circumstances in lots of places, but when we work together, we can figure out ways around that, and uh, we don't have any stronger partner or any better partner, uh, certainly, than the, uh, uh, the office that uh, the Jim holds and also the Attorney General Eric Holder. So I want to introduce next Dr. Jack Stein. Uh, Dr. Stein, uh, we were fortunate, lucky, uh, tremendously lucky to have Jack with us for an entire year. Uh, he, is, he was on loan from the National Institute of Drug Abuse. NIDA uh, conducts about 85% of the world's drug treatment programs. And in our foreign travels, we've been very... Uh, uh, fortunate to be able to give a lot of that information to other countries that perhaps aren't as engaged or aren't as knowledgeable, and Jack is a huge part of that. Uh, NIDA, of course, is headed by Dr. Uh, Nora Volkoff, and uh, we're sorry that Nora could not be here. She's overseas today, but we're extremely lucky to have Jack talk about this. The primary role that science plays in our work to inform drug policy is an important part of the program, and Jack heads as director of the Office of Science Policy and Communications at NIDA. So with that, I'll hand things over to you, Dr. Stein. I always feel like I need a box, but that's okay. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, Director, thank you so much. Uh, I know Deputy Directors uh, Mineta and Tucker are here. Thank you for that. Um, seeing uh, um, former Congressman Kennedy here is just such a big plus for, for all of us. And I also want to do a shout out to actually somebody who literally has been responsible for pretty much everything I know about uh, science and drug policy, and that's Dr. Timothy Condon, who is sitting in the office, audience somewhere. So I wouldn't be here without him, and that is very, very true. Uh, but it is a great honor to be here, and Dr. Volkova unfortunately is not. She is um, 
Uh, she is out of town, but uh, I, we were asked to, to spend just a few minutes helping set the foundation for today's conference, which of course is so in sync with the mission of NIDA, which is to uh, bring the power of science to bear on drug abuse and addiction, to really inform policy and practice. Well, let's start with a couple of key points, and I suspect this is no uh, great new news for many of you here, but hopefully it can help set our foundation with a couple of major principles. The first being, of course, that uh, addiction is a disease of the brain. Certainly in earlier years, people addicted to drugs were thought to be morally flawed and lacking in willpower. The emphasis, of course, was on punitive approaches rather than preventative and therapeutic actions. Today, thanks to science, our views and our responses to drug abuse have changed dramatically. Groundbreaking discoveries about the brain have revolutionized our understanding of drug addiction, enabling us to respond effectively to the problem. NIDA is going on 40 years next year, and so but with 40 years of research be behind us, we can really definitively say that addiction is a chronic, relapsing brain disease character characterized by con compulsive drug-seeking use despite harmful consequences. Now, we can say that because we know that drugs do one very important thing. They change the brain. They change the structure of the brain. They change how the brain works, which, of course, influences how people behave. And so addiction is very similar to other chronic conditions, like heart disease, for example. Both disrupt the normal, healthy functioning of the underlying organ, have serious harmful consequences, are preventable, treatable, and if left untreated, can last a lifetime. Now, another thing we Im important to talk about is the fact that addiction is a developmental disease. Science has demonstrated that it is a de developmental disease beginning primarily in adolescence. And why is this the case? Once again, the answer lies within the brain. The brain continues to develop during ad early adulthood, actually up into the early 20s and undergoes dramatic changes during adolescence. And one of the brain areas still maturing during adolescence we call the prefrontal cortex, right in the front of the brain. That's the part of the brain that enables us to assess situations, make sound decisions, keep our emotions and desires under control. The fact that this critical part of an adolescent's brain is still a work in progress puts young people at increased risk for poor decisions such as trying drugs or continued abuse. So for those of you who have teenagers in your life or have had teenagers in your life and you're trying to understand why are they doing that, part of it literally is they're developing, the, the brain is still in the throes of developing. So furthermore, research shows that the earlier an individual starts using drugs, the more likely they are to develop a substance use disorder later in life. And that is why prevention is so essential. And I'll get to that in one moment. So backing up a little more or digging a little deeper, why do people use drugs in the first place and ultimately become addicted? Well, a big part of the answer, of course, once again, is the brain and how the brain communicates. So for example, natural rewards, as pointed out in the bottom right a graph you see there. Natural rewards like food increase the release of a neurotransmitter called dopamine, resulting in our experiencing pleasure. This in turn results in our desire to repeat the activity again, in essence ensuring the survival of ourselves as well as the species. Drugs also result in increased dopamine levels, though at significantly higher levels, ranging from two to ten times, uh, two to ten times the amount produced in response to natural rewards. But as a comparison, just like we, we turn down the volume of a radio that is too loud, the brain adjusts the overwhelming surges in dopamine by producing less dopamine or by reducing the number of receptors that can receive signals. So with frequent use, the individual needs to take drugs just to try and bring their dopamine functioning back up to normal. And they must take larger amounts of the drug that they first did to recreate the initial high. And this, of course, is ultimately what we're talking about when we talk about addiction. So addiction involves multiple factors. We've been talking a lot about the biological, the genetic, the biological components of it, but 
Dopamine is not the only factor that influences vulnerability to addiction. Genetic factors also play a role. And in fact, they can account for between 40 to 60% of a person's likelihood of becoming addicted. In addition, environmental factors, home and family, peers and school, also play a tremendous role in vulnerability. So it's taking all of these factors which really influence how an individual ultimately will be affected by drugs. And of course, this influences the type of pre prevention as well as treatment interventions. The good news is that substance abuse is preventable, particularly when science-validated substance abuse prevention programs are properly implemented by schools and communities, alcohol, tobacco, and illicit drug abuse are reduced. Programs that help teachers, parents, and healthcare professionals shape young people's perceptions about the risk of drug abuse. However, we need infrastructures in place in which to implement these programs, and that's where I think a, a shout out is clearly due to the folks at CATCA who are here, the Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America, who've been working diligently for many years now to really create an infrastructure throughout the country in which to implement both community-wide as well as individual-based prevention programs. Now, when youth perceive drug abuse as harmful, they reduce their level of abuse. And unfortunately, vice versa, as reflected in this graph, which really tracks the association between attitudes and behaviors related to marijuana use. And as you can see, all the way to the right, we're going in the wrong direction. Also good news is that addiction can be treated. It need not be a life sentence. Just like other chronic diseases, addiction can be managed successfully and people can be assisted to recover. Evidence-based treatments enable people, people to counteract addiction's powerful disruptive effects on the brain and behavior and regain control of their lives. Now, we've made really great progress in treatment, both in terms of behavioral and pharmacological treatments, and some really new and exciting ones are on the way, such as, for example, vaccines that are being developed to prevent a drug from entering the brain and therefore not being able to cause their effects. And also, thanks to many of you here, there's a robust recovery movement underway that is really helping individuals successfully get through treatment and remain in a drug-free state way beyond when formal treatment may end. So to close, we've really made tremendous progress in our understanding of drug use and its consequences. However, we've got a ways to go in order to increase access and quality of care for those affected. And because of many of you here today, substance abuse services is very much a part of healthcare reform. The impact of healthcare reform on the substance abuse service delivery system is perhaps the most important policy research question for our field. And I believe for NIDA, we have a responsibility to study this major policy shift underway, and in fact, we are doing so. So I just want to thank you for inviting us here today. We look forward to our continued partnership with ONDCP, other federal agencies, and the many organizations that are represented here today to ensure that we fully implement the national drug control strategy uh, currently and well into the future. So thank you for your time, Director.